Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar titled Measuring Force in Single Heart Cells. My name is Andy Henton and I will be your host for today's event. I'm happy to share that we have well over 100 guests logged in for today's session uh, from all over the world. Uh, and today's event is sponsored by Ion Optics and is focused on new techniques and technologies that are enabling scientists to make precision force measurements in both cardiac and skeletal muscle cells. Our first presenter joining us today is Dr. Benjamin Prosser. Dr. Prosser received exemplary training in cardiovascular and muscle biology from Drs. W.J. Lederer and Martin Schneider and has recently transitioned to an independent position at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He is an expert in cardiac cellular and subcellular calcium imaging, mechanics, and redox and reactive oxygen species biology. He has a unique understanding of the complex interplay between ROS and calcium signaling in the heart and is positioned as an emerging leader in the field of this increasingly important topic as evidenced by a number of recent national and international presentations on this topic and publications in high impact journals. Along with doctors, uh, excuse me, along with doctors Letterer and Ward, Dr. Prosser developed novel techniques to attach and stretch myocytes using a bi biological adhesive called Myotac which happens to be a focus of his presentation today. Following we will hear from Dr. Michael Helms. Dr. Helms completed his PhD on mechanical properties of cardiac myocytes and the role of Titan under the mentorship of Hank Grenzi. Soon after completing his PhD, Dr. Helms joined Ion Optics. Over the years he has also complemented his work at Ion Optics with several research positions at academic centers including Boston University, Maastricht University and Oxford. Currently, Dr. Helms holds the position of Science Director at Ion Optics and combines this with a research position at the VU Medical Center of the VU University in Amsterdam. Well, great. Thanks for the, uh, the introduction, Andy, and uh, thanks for joining us, everyone, online. And so let's first just briefly discuss <clears throat> why we want to do these measurements of force and control length in single heart cells. And the bottom line is that the whole organ level cardiac responses to changes in blood pressure, autonomic nervous cues, mechanical stimuli, they're all driven by intrinsic cellular mechanisms uh, that are still incompletely understood. And these mechanisms are critical to matching cardiac output to demand. And include the classic uh, Frank Starling mechanism where a diastolic stretch or a preload pressure filling of a heart cell triggers an immediate increase in cell contractile force you have the ANREP or slow force response where a sustained change in afterload pressure uh, leads to an increase in intracellular calcium release and contractility and the force frequency relationship that maximizes cardiac output with increased heart rate. And single cell studies allow us to evaluate the interplay between mechanical, electrical and biochemical cell signaling pathways that underlie these and other regulatory mechanisms. And so the enzymatically isolated cardiomyocyte has long been an invaluable model to study the cardiovascular system. But the great majority of these studies in cells are done under mechanically unloaded conditions. And more and more evidence demonstrates how cardiomyocyte physiology and pathology are really profoundly influenced by mechanical stimuli. And thus these studies present a somewhat incomplete story. So this process of converting these mechanical stimuli into cellular responses is broadly known as mechanotransduction. And it's really a hot area of study uh, that's still largely poorly understood. And mechanotransduction occurs in all cell types, but it's particularly important in the heart, which experiences strain and stress with each heartbeat, and is also exposed to compression, torsion, shear. And in general, mechanotransduction in the heart begins with a physiological adaptation to the mechanical stimuli, but can quickly degrade to pathological or maladaptive signaling based on the strength, the duration, the nature of the mechanical stimulus, as well as the underlying genetic background. And really understanding what drives this transition is critical to our understanding of pathogenesis. And this understanding has been hampered to some extent by a lack of tools to properly interrogate mechanosignaling in the heart cell. And this certainly hasn't been due to any lack of effort as many groups have utilized different approaches to stretch muscle cells, study cell signaling, 
uh, making important discoveries along the way that have laid the groundwork for current research. These include osmotic swelling of cells, adhering cells to a flexible membrane that can then be stretched, poking cells and stretching them with a glass stylus or even sucking them into two micropipettes, and most prominently perhaps attaching them to micromanipulators such as carbon fibers to control length and assay contractility. And while valuable, each approach has significant limitations. Uh, whether it be a non-physiological mechanical stress, uh, perhaps lacking dynamic control of length and force to mimic the rapid changes in a beating heart cell, or not allowing the direct measurement of force. And the most promising of these techniques, utilizing carbon fibers, suffers from an unreliable attachment that makes these experiments rather low throw throughput with uh, great difficulty in measuring large forces, particularly exceeding two micronewtons. So our goals were to establish a method that improves the strength and reliability of the attachment to cells, allowing us to directly measure force under the most physiological conditions. <clears throat> And there was a real need for this in Dr. John Letterer's lab at the University of Maryland where I did my postdoc. As in a collaboration with Gintaro Uribe and Peter Cole, our group had just discovered that stretching a heart cell triggers a burst of subcellular calcium release events known as calcium sparks. And these experiments were done using the carbon fiber technique and we needed a more reproducible and robust system to carry out the high number of experiments necessary to reveal the underlying signaling of this phenomenon and its effects on myocyte physiology and pathology. And so we set out to design a system to assay mechanotransduction in cells. And it took small, stiff glass micro rods, about 25 microns in diameter, and coated them with a biological glue my colleagues and I developed that we call myotac, uh, evidenced by the thin film seen here. The myotech sticks to cell membranes and adheres the cell to the micro rod. And so connected to one of the micro rods is a high sensitivity force transducer and the other to a piezoelectric length controller which provides rapid control of cell length. And this system is all set on a high speed confocal microscope also equipped for patch clamp electrophysiology really allowing us to assay the interplay between cell length changes, EC coupling, and contractile force generation. Now we've also made the myotech fluorescent so that we can visualize the interaction between myotech and the cell. All right, so what is myotech? Myotech is a non-toxic biocompatible glue. And I emphasize non-toxic because this is in contrast to a number of other commercially available adhesives that we first tried with no success. And it, myotech mimics the cell's natural attachment to extracellular matrix. It consists of two primary components, a mix of matrix proteins that have been optimized to ensure the appropriate viscosity and stickiness of the glue for experiments to be done in solution at room and physiological temperatures. And the second component is a pre-coat made of one micron diameter inert beads in a protonaceous solution that coats and rough studs the micro rods increasing the surface area of contact between the cell and the studded glue-coated rod. So these next couple of slides will focus on practical tips and tricks for optimizing experiments with myotech. So this is really for the users. And properly coating the micro rods with myotech is the critical step to ensuring a productive experimental day. And different groups have adopted their own best practices to ensure optimal coating on their setup but I think there's some tips that are really universal. And so, in general, coating consists of two steps. First, coating the micro rods with pre-coat, and then coating with glue. And all coating should really be done under an optical microscope. It's very difficult to ensure reproducible coating without being able to visualize this process. So what we do is we pipette a small one to two microliter drop of either pre-coat or glue, depending on what step you're on, on a small piece of cover glass that we place in our experimental chamber. We coat the rods in these small volume solutions, observe the process under the microscope, then remove the rods, remove that piece of cover glass, and carry on with our experiments. So when dipping in pre-coat, 
You dip for about 10 to 30 seconds of a, at a time, then take the rods out and check the rods for a uniform coating like you see on the low magnification and high magnification images here. When the desired pre-coat is reached, the rod should then be allowed to air dry, ideally for 30 minutes or more. Otherwise, some pre-coat can slough off in solution. Now, if you're only doing simple passive stretch experiments, low strain, without active contraction, you may find that you can skip this pre-coat step and maintain a strong enough attachment with just the glue alone. So step two is coating with the glue. And myotech should always be maintained on ice. So then this droplet uh, that you used for coating is going to slowly become more viscous once exposed to room temperature. So when dipping the rods in the glue, it's important to monitor the viscosity of the glue. So every 30 seconds or so, remove the rods from the glue. And when the myotech has reached the appropriate viscosity, which typically occurs within one to five minutes, it'll offer some resistance when pulling the rods out of the glue, and some glue will pull away with the rods. So if you just submerge the tips of the rods in the glue, when you pull the rods out of the glue, some will be left forming a small bubble of myotech at the tips of the rods, like you can see in panel B here. And this bubble should really be as close to the tip as possible. If you wait too long and the glue hardens, you'll pull out a massive lump of glue on the rods that will disrupt the experiments. So you then want to allow the glue to air dry for about a minute before resubmerging it in your recording solution. And once in solution and hydrated, you can't expose the glue to the air for more than a few seconds, or it will really rapidly harden and begin to lose its stickiness. So once you have your finished product of a pre-coated micro rod with glue, a single coat should last for experiments for anywhere from two to four hours. The glue can be washed off fairly easily in a 10% acetic acid solution, and then you can re-coat the rods and reuse them uh, over many experimental days. So this 3D reconstruction of fluorescent myotech coated rods attached to a cardiomyocyte shows a proper coating in three dimensions. It will create a relatively thin uh, 2 to 10 micron sticky layer of glue surrounding the rods. You orient your rods parallel to the cell membrane and this should provide a relatively large surface area of contact like you can see here in the video. So in the early stages of coating, we found it helpful to use the fluorescent myotech to really optimize coating conditions. So for cell attachment, you simply press down on one end of the cell and gently until you see a slight deformation, which you'll see in the video right about now, you see the deformation of the membrane. At this point, the myotech will attach rapidly to the cell. You can lift it off of the bottom of the chamber, bring the cell back into focus. And again, I emphasize slight because previous experiments with carbon fibers required a bit of crushing down on the cell, and this can disrupt these delicate signaling complexes. So the goal is to maximize the surface area of contact between the cell and the glue-coated rods during attachment. So for Passive stretch experiments, things are fairly simple and straightforward. You should be able to attach a cell, lift it off the dish, and then stretch it to pretty long sarcomere lengths without any slippage from the rods, like you see in the video here. Active contraction measurements require a bit more practice and skill. So we've been able to routinely assay large magnitude forces, but we've been doing this for a while, and cells will still pop off the rods from time to time uh, particularly under hypercontractile conditions, such as adrenergic stimulation or at long diastolic lengths. And so for measurements of active contraction, before the first stimulated contraction, I recommend introducing some slack into the system. Move the rods closer together and remove any tension on the cell. And this is recommended particularly when working with rat and mouse cells, where the sarcoplasmic reticulum is overloaded with calcium in the quiescent cell. And there's a particularly large calcium release and contraction for the first few twitches before the cell reaches steady state. So by introducing slack in the system, you decrease the likelihood of the cell popping off the rod with that first massive contraction. You can then stretch the cell back to the desired sarcomere length upon reaching steady state and proceed with your experiment. 
So being able to monitor sarcomere length changes simultaneously with force, as is offered on these current turnkey systems that use this technology, can really provide a nice measure of confidence that you're maintaining a robust attachment to the cell during a protocol, that cell's not slipping from the rocks. And you can see this in these consistent sarcomere length excursions here, uh, doing a 1 versus 4 hertz frequency stretch protocol. So as an example of what you can do with this technique, uh, we were able to uncover this mechanism by which stretch regulates calcium signal, as well as some of its physiological and pathophysiological ramifications. So we found that mechanical stretch rapidly increases the production of reactive oxygen species, or ROS, in cardiac and skeletal muscle through this enzyme NADPH oxidase, or NOx2, as we call it. We found the integrity of the microtubular cytoskeleton was critical to transducing this mechanical signal to NOx2. And importantly, we found the ROS production to be precisely graded by the frequency and the amplitude of cell stretch, factors of the heart rate and preload pressure, respectively. Finally, the ROS served to increase the activity of intracellular calcium release channels, the ryanidin receptors, to enhance cardiac calcium signaling. We also investigated how this same mechanical stimulus regulated signaling on a compromised genetic background. And so when we stretched heart cells from the murine model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which presents with a progressive dilated cardiomyopathy, stretch still triggered the same burst of calcium sparks, but frequently triggered a regenerative wave of calcium that propagated through the cell and which is linked to the formation of arrhythmias. So this increased sensitivity to the same physiologic stretch could be attributed to increased ROS production with each diastolic stretch in the cardiomyopathic cells, which correlated with this high frequency of calcium waves. We also found a conserved mechanism in skeletal muscle from the same muscular dystrophy model, yet here the stretch-dependent ROS production regulated detrimental calcium influx through the sarcolemma. So I highlight this because to perform these studies required mechanical control experiments with precise control on literally thousands of cells, which I share just to emphasize that this can be a rather high throughput technique uh, once properly established in the lab. So I mentioned skeletal muscle here. To stretch and measure force in skeletal muscle demands some upgrades to the system to accommodate the much larger size, greater force generation of a skeletal muscle fiber. So you see here a mouse skeletal muscle FDB fiber kind of dwarfs the rat cardiomyocyte in this cold culture. And coated glass rods are really insufficient to maintain attachment to contracting skeletal muscle fibers uh, that can generate 100 times more force during tetany than uh, compared to the twitch of a ventricular myocyte. So my colleagues, including uh, Chris Ward, John Litter, and I have been working with Ion Optics to develop a more robust attachment modality. And to this end, we're using a myotac coated cell holder that has a laser etched concavity designed to cup over the myofiber, increasing the surface area of attachment between the fiber and the glue. And with this technique, we can more precisely control skeletal muscle length as a larger magnitude forces. As you can see here with this 20 hertz stimulation, for example, under virtually isometric conditions. You can see very small changes in sarcomere length. Uh, but again, this work is still in progress. So we've also been working on the parallel improvements in the heart, where we've now been using the recently developed interferometer-based force transducer that produces really excellent signal to noise that I know Michael will go into detail about. Uh, but we're also utilizing a similar cell holder approach as in skeletal muscle but with a smaller 8 micron by 30 micron laser etched cavity optimized for the dimensions of a heart cell. And you can see from these orthogonal sections from a confocal Z stack of a heart cell, it's been attached at one end with a glass rod. And you have this somewhat limited area of contact with the glue seen here and here while at the other end it's attached with our new cell holder where the etched concavity cups over the cell and provides a greater surface area of attachment, a better hold, and the assay of larger forces. 
And so while this is still a work in progress, we hope it will facilitate simpler, more reproducible assays of larger forces, particularly for groups looking to measure isometric tension at longer sarcomere lengths or under adrenergic stimulation. So in summary, the isolated intact cardiac myocyte is really an ideal model to study physiologically and pathophysiologically relevant mechanics and mechanosignaling. And these new tools can provide a robust, high-throughput assay of mechanosignaling in heart and in skeletal muscle cells. Now, these experiments aren't easy, um, as are most things worth doing, of course. Uh, but with being careful to optimize coding, uh, some hands-on experience, some patience, they're certainly doable and can really be quite fruitful, we found. So with that, I'll, I'll wish you all the best of luck, and I think I'll close there, um, not before I thank, of course, the following folks, particularly uh, Dr. John Lederer and Dr. Chris Ward, who were instrumental in establishing these techniques. And thank you guys again uh, for joining us. Hello. Thank, uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining this webinar. I um, hope you are enjoying it. Uh, Ben gave a great uh, introduction to how we developed the glue and uh, how you can actually stick myocytes. Uh, here will I try to explain how we came to build an entirely new force transducer. And the second half of the talk I'll, I'll spend on an application, how to measure work loops and the power curve of a single heart cell. Ben went over this already. We have been able to measure the force for a while, but the most successful people that use carbon fibers to do uh, the stretching those fibers were not available. They were made in 1990, one of time. And so there was never going to be able to make an off-the-shelf uh, system where you could just buy the system. So the equipment was complicated. The forces that you could measure were not quite as high as you would like. So the experiments never quite took off. Of course, with uh, the MyTech developed by uh, the laboratory of John Letter with Chris Ward and Ben Prosser, changed all that. All of a sudden, it was sticky enough to measure the force development in mouse myocytes and in rat myocytes. We could measure about triple the force that we could measure before. And here you see an example. In myocytes, you see the sarcomere pattern. Here is one of the fibers that is stretching the myocyte. And here is a fiber that we made long enough and compliant enough that the force of the myocyte is bending the glass fiber. This gives you an estimation of force. You can see that here. Low length, small force. You stretch the cell a few times, and you get a much higher force production. You see the sarcomere shortening. You see there is internal shortening. And at the same time, you can measure your calcium transients. This is a few two recording. So with this available, we decided to dust off our old prototype of a myo stretcher that we developed for Oxford in the early 2000s uh, and make it into a proper product. So it's essentially an attachment to our existing calcium contractility system or whatever system you have to measure your cell shortening, your, uh, your fluorescence. Um, it consists of an optical rail that you mount onto any microscope. On that rail is a 3D manipulator. You need that to attach the cell and another 3D manipulator because you need to attach the other side as well. Arms that extend to it and reach out into the bath. Why do we extend them so far? Well, here is going to be your condenser you still need to be able to get a good image of your myocyte. And here are the holders that are going to contain those micro glass fibers that attach the cell to. Um, and you can also put a force transducer here or a piezo motor here. This shows you the optical rail mounted on the microscope. In this case, we do have a very fast piezo motor attached to it. Here you see the optical fiber of the force transducer, the cell chamber that can rotate so you can orient the cell. And Here's a force probe, and here's the side from the piezo motor. You can see the little glass fiber to which we will attach the cell. You can very faintly see it here as well. So our dilemma was, how are we going to measure force? Are we going to keep using fiber bending, or are we going to put in a force transducer? It was not an easy choice, because the thing is, using the bending of glass fibers, it's cheap, maybe a few cents per glass fiber if you break one. It's cheerful for the same reason. You break your force transducer, you stick up another piece of glass and off you go again. And the signal to noise is actually pretty good. And they're stable. They're not temperature sensitive at all. They can withstand uh, an amount of flow in the chamber. And they're very responsive. The trouble is, it's hard to control the exact length of the cell. But what is worse 
they're difficult to calibrate. You can use another voice transducer to calibrate them, but it turns out the results are quite variable. So you never quite know the exact force level to attach to it, but it still makes it a great choice for stretching the cells and getting relative force changes. Um, so we decided to put in an existing force transducer, but all the force transducers that are available, this is the one from Aurora, and we thought this was the very best there is, and this is a very good force transducer, but we are operating at the bottom half percent of its range. And it's just not designed for that, so the signal-to-noise ratio suffers. Moreover, classic force transducers have an additional problem. They contain electronics. So you have a body of electronics, and then a stylus that sticks out of it, goes through the air-water interface, and sticks to the cells. Going through the air-water interface makes you very susceptible to external noise. And moreover, if the solution level changes, change in buoyancy will change the force reading and greatly outweigh the force development of the myocyte itself. So we'll never be able to get a really stable force transducer. And on top of that, because the force measure must push so far, you get a pretty low resonance frequency again, which makes it susceptible to external noise and reduces and, and it slows the response time down to a few up to a few milliseconds. Uh, we thought this is just not going to do justice to the experiments. Um, so we were pondering what to do till chance helped, I ran, to an, I ran into a professor of the, the physics department here, David Januzzi, and it turns out he had just transformed an interferometer to measure material properties of very soft properties by indentation. Um, I saw that and I thought if you change the orientation, it's already a force transducer. So I asked him to do that. We did the experiment. This was one of our first tries. These are unfiltered data and show the length dependent activation of myocytes. We thought this is so fantastic. We have to, we have to make this product. So then we started to develop it. Um, what is an interferometer? An interferometer uses a laser to measure the distance between the tip of an optical fiber and a mirror. In our case, a gold-coated cantilever. It can measure so with nanometer accuracy. You measure force by measuring the displacement of the fiber and multiplying it with the spring constant. But for all practical purposes you have an isometric force transducer because the deflection will maybe 30, 40 nan nanometer for a myocyte contraction. So now I have a force transducer that is fully optical. All the materials are compatible with physiological salt solution, 37 degrees. Here you see a picture of the, of the actual probe. This is a glass block that is 3 millimeters by 3 millimeters. We glue the cantilever which is a very well specified piece of rectangular uh, glass. And this is the optical fiber that comes in from the outside. And we measure the distance between the tip of this fiber and the cantilever. Here you see the glass microfiber that we actually going to attach the cell to. The position in the bath is like this. So the cantilever comes down, the, 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 the microfiber comes off at a slight angle so that it will clear the bottom of the, the glass ferrule. The cantilever will not clear the glass ferrule. So even if you bump the block of glass into your cover slip, it will just bend the glass fiber, but it will not break the cantilever. Because it's all below solution, we can have a force trace with a very stable baseline. Because it's so small, you get a very high resonance frequency. So if someone walks through the room, you will hardly pick it up because it just doesn't pick up the slow frequencies very well. Uh, on the other hand, it's extremely responsive. Uh, uh, the response times are well below a millisecond. Just shows you just a, a tracing where we do length steps. As, just like Ben showed before, you step up the length, the force development of the mice that increase, you step, step it down again, you get a lower you get a lower force response, you stretch it a little bit more, you get a stronger force response, and from this you can construct your end diastolic force length relations, your end systolic force length relations. You pick these values for your end diastolic force length relations, you pick the peak values for your end systolic force length relations, you plot them against each other, and you get a measure for the length dependent uh, activation of the myocyte. This shows you another tracing. Here we see the nice signal to noise ratio. It allows you to measure very subtle changes. So this is a mouse myocyte pasted at room temperature here at 2 Hz. Even at 2 Hz, they already become somewhat calcium overloaded at room temperature. 
you see as soon as you switch down the pacing frequency, there's extra time for reuptake of the calcium, so the diastolic force drops dramatically, you get a really strong contraction, and then within three, four beats, there's no equilibrium. How sensitive is, how sensitive is the force transducer? How low can we go? This shows you an example where we look at a skeletal myofibril, as you can see, many times smaller than a myocyte. And we're looking just at the passive properties here. So we stretch the cell to different lengths. This is the sarcomere response. And here's the force response. You see the arrow bar, the bar. This is only 200 nanonewton. We can easily pick up these forces. Just to keep in mind, if you look at the active force of a uh, myofibril, it will pretty much come to the top of the screen, if not further. Uh, how high can we go? Anything is possible. The readout is completely independent from the from the probe itself. So if we were to make a steel probe, we could measure the forces of big muscles. Uh, but anyway, we can make adapters to fit any preparation, really, trabeculae, skeletal muscle, or whatever you can think of. Uh, so now that we have a fast, stable, and sensitive force transducer, what could we do with it? I figured I had to find an application that would do us justice. So if you force of a force development by a myocyte, we always look at isometric contractions, but that's not, that's not what happens in the heart. In the heart, the cell shortens, which mitigates its force development. So you can modulate the force development by changing the cell length. So I was wondering, could we mimic the cardiac cycle by controlling the pre and after load using feedback on the force signal and using a very fast, very fast piezo motor? That's what we tried to, uh, to accomplish. So just as a reminder, here's your classic uh, pressure volume uh, relation. You have your pressure wave, this is just a standard textbook, the ejection of the blood, and if you plot the pressure against the ejection, you get what's called the pressure volume curve. And the area inside this curve is the work that the heart does on the blood, which is of course in the end is all that matters. Um, so just to walk you through the cardiac cycle quickly. A simple model of the heart, the ventricle, the aorta with its valve, the atrium with its mitral valve. We start at end diastole, 100 millimeters mercury in the aorta, about 10 millimeters mercury in the ventricle and the atrium. Mitral valve is open, the aortic valve is closed. The contraction starts and the force starts to rise. The mitral valve closes, closes, the blood has nowhere to go, so the pressure goes up, but the volume doesn't change. Until you exceed the pressure in the aorta, the heart starts to empty, so the pressure stays more or less the same, but the volume goes down. End of systole, pressure drops, the aortic valve slams shut, so the blood can't go anywhere again, the force drops, no change in volume, the mitral valve opens when the pressure, dro pressure drops sufficiently and the heart fills again. And the work is a change in pressure against a change in volume. If you go to the single cell, it will be the change in length times the change in force. So this is how we're going to do it with a single myocyte. Here's your myocyte attached to the force needle and the motor attached needle. At the start of the contraction, we don't do anything until you exceed the afterload threshold. We start to shorten the cell. At the end of systole, we stop shortening. When the force drops, we stretch the cell again. Sounds simple, it took a bit of work to get it going, but we managed in the end. So just to take you through it, here we have an isometric contraction, this is the motor, it doesn't do anything. Here's an isometric contraction, here we switch on the work loop module, so it immediately starts to correct for the force, and then we step out to, up to preload, so it stretches the cell to go to the new preload level, And then we continuously change the afterload. So the modulation also changes and changes and changes until you almost reach an isometric contraction here. We go down and preload. We step up to, down an afterload. We step up to preload and we repeat this experiment. So there's an interplane between the force development of the myocyte and control of the motor. So if we look at one of the tracings, this is actually at room temperature. The previous uh, slide was at 37 degrees. In blue we have an isometric contraction, the shape of the contraction that you all know well. Here we enable the control loop and as soon as it 
crosses the afterload, we start to shorten the myocyte. So force can't develop any further. At some point the force drops and the motor will reverse direction to be able to keep controlling it. At the moment the motor reverses direction, we know that's the end of systole, we stop the control and we let the cell relax. Till the force drops below the preload, we stretch it to keep the force constant at its preload level. If you then plot the force against the length, here's the equivalent of the PV loop, your force length curve. It's a pretty shallow uh, loop in this case, but it depends on the, the afterload level. If you would have a much higher afterload, we would get a loop that is much, uh, much taller. What you see here is another example, still at room temperature. Here's the force uh, development based at 2 Hz. We don't do any control. Here we enable the force control and we put the afterload and the preload really close together so you get an almost isotonic contraction where the force doesn't change but the length does. You see the motor has to work very hard to keep up with it. That's this very shallow loop. And then we dial up. I literally had a dial that said afterload. I dialed up the afterload <coughs> until we reached isometric contractions. And you see that the loops get taller and taller and taller and taller. And you have a nice linear and systolic force length relation. Don't mind this part, this is not linear, but this is at extremely short sarcoma lengths where probably different processes start to take place. You wouldn't see that in the whole heart. We step up to preload, so we have a new preload level now. The cell gets stretched to a longer length. You can also reach higher force levels now. And you see the systolic force length relation is maintained. We step up to preload again. We now get a good sense of the end diastolic force length relation and still and systolic force length relation is unchanged. And we, here we have the Frank Starling effect in a single cell. I'm just going to show you one preliminary experiment, experiment that we did with this. Um, it was a day that we had pretty bad cells. So you could say these were cells with diastolic dysfunction and clearly we couldn't stretch it very well because it did not relax very well. So I figured why not throw a little bit of BDM in there. BDM inhibits active myosin interaction. So it's generally used to depress force levels. But in this case, it inhibited the force much more prominently in diastole, allowing the cell to relax. And adding a little bit of BDM greatly increased the amount of work that, uh, that the cell could do. If you look what happens exactly, you see not a lot is happening to the force because we clamp the, the pre and the afterload levels. If you look at the length change, this is the artifact where we switch to a solution with BDM. This is where the BDM reaches the cell. As soon as it reaches the cell, the heart starts to relax better in diastole, but as we keep the force level constant, it stretches the cell. And you see this back in the sarcomere tracing, where finally the cell can relax to much more normal and diastolic levels. Um, <coughs> it shows you one possible application of mission work, work, loop, work loops. Um, we then moved on to improve the experiments because I really wanted to measure at 37 degrees. Um, so we had to bring in temperature control. We got that to work. And the previous experiments were a bit cumbersome because I had two computers, I had a hardware box where I had to literally dial the knobs to, uh, to change my pre and afterload. So we built in uh, signal generators into the software. So we've got pre-programmed protocols. Here this is a protocol that we'll be using for the rest of the slides where I step up the preload a few times and I continuously change the afterload. So we get as many contractions with different pre and afterload combination. So we get a kind of a full curve within about 20 seconds. Here you show what happens. One preload level, two preload levels, three preload level. On every preload level we change the afterload. And here's the different uh, the different control responses for the different afterloads. Here you do hardly do any control of the so this is the piezo motor signal. Here you have an isometric contraction here we almost reach an isometric contraction. What does that get us? You can plot the force against the length. You can see your work loops appear in pretty much real time. You see that first preload and you see the loops getting taller. The second preload, the loops getting taller to reach almost an isometric contraction. And the same here for the third loop. I can do the same thing because we're at 37 degree now the cell is fast, so we can easily do it at 4 Hz as well, 240 beats per minute. So we're starting to approach the physiological heart range for the rat. Uh, and you see the same uh, 
the same general picture. So what was what, what did we want to do with uh, with the workload subsequently? So what happens if you're at one preload and you vary the afterload? You go from an isometric contraction. We have a lot of force development since uh, you never crossed uh, the afterload, the set afterload level. You get no shortening. Our work is change in force times change in length. Change in length is zero, so we don't do any work. So that's this point of the curve, no work. At the other extreme, we have an isotonic contraction where you prevent force development by shortening the cell very much. You get a lot of length change, no force change. Again, the work you do is zero. And everything in between will be intermediate until at some point you reach a peak, uh, to the point where you do peak work. It's a quadratic relation. I have other data that show that you can nicely go over this peak. It turns out at 37 degrees, uh, the algorithm, algorithm had a little bit trouble with uh, the more isotonic contractions. Um, we're working on that. So I could do these experiments for 1 hertz, 2 hertz, 4 hertz, 6 hertz, 8 hertz, because once you've attached the cell on the myotech and you lift it up, up, the preparation is actually very stable. I think the myotech is so much more softer than a glass copper slip that the cells don't damage themselves so quickly. So you can actually do experiments for 40 or 50 minutes if, uh, if you're careful with the cell. And we could repeat this protocol multiple times. Um, for all these series, we... Uh, measured all the work for the different conditions. We use LabChart to do it. You have a beautiful module to uh, to calculate the, the ancestral force length relation and end diastolic force length relation. Of course, in their case, the end diastolic pressure volume relation, but it applies. How can we then construct a power curve? You take the peak of the work for each contraction. You multiply it with the basing frequency. And you can see straight away, if you're at 1 hertz, the red myocyte does not produce a lot of power. So this power is in picojoules per second. <clears throat> you get to proper power levels when you move towards the physiological frequencies. And here you see that there's not a lot of dramatic changes anymore. And the main determinant becomes the preload that you apply to the myocyte. Of course, these cells are not stimulated uh, better adrenergically. If you would do that, I'm pretty sure that the peak frequency where you develop maximum power would shift to the right, and the power generated would shift way up. But that's the next step of experiments. Um, so that shows you what uh, what we have been doing in our lab so far with uh, with our new force issues. So, uh, I hope it is interesting. To summarize, we have developed a force transducer that bridges the gap between AFM, which is in the piconewton range, and classic force transducers, micronewtons and up. And by playing with the thickness of our uh, force probe, we can really go below nanonewtons, and we can el actually also cover this range, although there already exist good force transducers for this range. It is designed, designed with physiology experiments in mind, so it's compatible with salt solutions, with the temperatures you encounter in physiology experiments, and of course, we use non-toxic materials as much as we can. What I showed you is how you can use the force transducer to do force control at the myocyte level. So we can now mimic the cardiac cycle and measure the power a myocyte can generate. You could ask, is that relevant? Um, uh, I decided to quote uh, Professor James Budich, uh, who published about this in the Biophysical Journal Review in 2014. He says it is relevant. If you look at hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, it's recognized as hypercontractile, suggesting that the power output is higher than that of the normal heart. Conversely, the clinical features of DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy patients, are characterized by reduced systolic function, leading to lower, out lower output than that of the normal heart. Therapies could be directed towards either reducing the power output or increasing it. He continues, of course, by saying life is never that simple, and put in a lot of disqualifiers, but at least we do have another good tool now to study the power output of a myocyte. And with that, I, will th I would like to thank you for listening, uh, and I'll give it back to um, the researcher after, of course, I thank the people I work with, Professor Yolanda van der Velden, in whose lab I'm working, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work in our lab. RF, who collected most of the nice data traces you saw in this talk, he has very good hands.
Professor, Professor David Yanuzzi from the physics department, without whom there would have been no new towards transducer, Ernest Braille, a master student who developed the first work loop algorithms, and at Ion Optics, Tom Udale, our lead engineer, without whom probably none of the hardware and software changes would have been accomplished. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Andy. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. Um, so yes, I'll just uh, I'll just take over presentation here for our audience, and um, I'm going to bring on obviously Dr. Ben Prosser as well. So Ben, just chime in when you're with us, and I'm also bringing on uh, Joe Seguer to the uh, to the line. He is an application scientist and manager of business development with Ion Optics. Uh, Joe, are you with us? Yes, I am. Excellent. Andy, I'm here as well. Perfect. All right. Great to have you, Ben. So uh, we're all online, and so at this point, this is when we move into our Q&A. Uh, we've had a uh, number of questions come in through the questions panel, but again, we invite all attendees to uh, fire away, as they say now. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can, and um, I'm going to kick things off with... Um, uh, we've got a question just to... Um, there's a few that came in where they'd like uh, you guys to clarify how stretch is applied in a scientific application. So how you would control this and then maybe different the requirements uh, as far as uh, maybe product or and, and methods. We use a, we use a piezo motor from, uh, in, in our case we use uh, Mad City Labs. Most piezos or most motors will do if you all you care about is doing uh, stretches and then holds. Okay. That's not a very fast process because you want to have a fairly rapid response uh, for your force control in, uh, in systole because the systolic force goes up so rapidly. We use a direct drive a piezo from Mad City Labs, just, to, just the best we could find for this work. Okay, excellent. And there's no other process manually or others, uh, otherwise that would be applicable. It's uh, basically this is a motor controlled process. Yes. Okay. You can, what, course, what? Also always use your micro manipulator to manually stretch your myocyte. If you, that's what I did for a long time until I had the piezo. Okay. Essentially, when you're setting up and you're first attaching your cell, you're setting it to whichever preferred resting length you want. All those manipulations are going to be done on the motor, on the micro manipulator level. And then once you set up your experiment and start your experiment, it's fully programmed, motor driven uh, piezo that drives the length changes. Okay. Excellent. Well, I think that addresses uh, the questions. We had a few that came in in that regard. So. Um, Let's move on to another, and also uh, specifically, uh, the, uh, some of our audience would like to know if this system can be used with cardiac IPS cells. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that one, Michael. Yeah. Um, it hasn't been done yet, uh, but we've been in contact with a few different labs that are interested in doing it. Uh, certainly, the, the sensitivity of the force transducer suggests that it could be used easily. Um, the, the issue will come up on how do we attach them. There's a lot of heterogeneity in IPS cells. Um, it, for a single IPS cell, they're, they're pretty small. It's not obviously the same morphology uh, as an adult cardiac myocyte. But um, for cells that are grown in small clusters, uh, we, we should be able to attach them. Um, and like I said, we've been in contact with a couple labs that are interested in doing it. Okay, great. Um... Okay, I, I'm going to, we've also had a number of questions come in, kind of around hardware software requirements and then how they may connect together. So um, again, uh, probably Michael and, and, and Joe, if you can speak to any specific hardware requirements or how the hardware is arranged so that it can be connected to um, a data acquisition or software system. And then in that event, uh, I guess, Michael, for you, what would be required on the software to generate the work loops that you were showing and possibly analyze them? So maybe just some additional background information uh, in, in that light. Um, the system is, of course, uh, continuously in development. The system as it stands, it has uh, the force transducer, it has a piezo motor. You can drive the piezo motor directly from the software using the signal generators that are built into the software. Having said that, you saw the optical rail. The force transducer has an analog output. The piezo has an analog input. So if, you're, if you have your own la uh, lab view software, MATLAB software, or the commercial systems that can uh, take in and put out those analog signals, you can also use the my stretcher as such. Um, okay. Uh, the second half of the question, I think, was uh, what, what was the second half to, to Well, ba yeah, I think it's specifically, yeah, generating the work loops. 
um, if there's anything required, um, you know, I right. think this would be more about generating XY plots, but then also um, analyzing uh, that data. As, as people familiar with iNoptic software, you could see that it did not do the the force length loop anal analysis in, uh, in iNoptics. Those were uh, lab chart pictures from uh, AT Instruments uh, lab okay. chart. And you have an excellent PV module. And if you have a power lab, you can just feed in the, you can feed in your force signal, you can feed in your uh, piezo position signal, and you will see the work loops appear in real time. Huh? Okay. And so it's fair. To all internalize it into our software, but that's still a project under development. Huh? Okay. But it's fully feasible as is. Huh? Perfect. Excellent. Um, okay, so maybe a, um, a question for Ben um, in regards to myotech. How long is a batch of myotech good for, and and can it be reused? Um, so we keep the myotech in small aliquots in the freezer, um, typically ten to twenty microliter aliquots, and we'll thaw them on ice, always on ice, and then once thawed, it can be. And, and as long as it's kept on ice or in the fridge, it can be used usually for about three or four days. So we basically use about an aliquot a week. Um, and then it'll, it'll start uh, sort of losing its stickiness after three or four days of use. Um, now, as far as when they're frozen in the, in, when they're kept at minus 20, um, we've used stocks for, for over a year um, without any problem. Okay, great. Um... And then, I guess, kind of in the same line, are there any tips for optimizing cell isolation protocols um, uh, for experiments with myotech? So, uh, I think every, every lab has sort of their own um, best practices and, and things they'll swear by. But, but one thing that's been somewhat consistent is we want to pay attention to how the membranes are digested during the enzymatic isolation. And so, um, most folks use a collagenase-based solution um, to isolate uh, single cells, um, sometimes adding uh, other enzymes, uh, protease, trypsin, for example. Um, we try to keep those out of our solutions and use a, a solely a collagenase-based solution. And we also try to minimize the digestion time needed. Um, so a longer digestion time will often give a higher yield of cells, but you always have plenty of cells for physiology experiments. So we err on the shorter side of digestion to preserve as much of that membrane and matrix system as possible because that's what's involved in the attachment to my attack. So I think those would be a couple tips for um, optimizing your cell isolation protocol for these kind of experiments. Okay, that's excellent. Um, just a, a quick moment just to get organized here. We're having great response from our audience, so thank you to the audience. Keep chiming in, uh, bring in the questions. We're just about at our hour point, but as usual, we're going to extend our Q&A. Uh, for those that can remain online, please do. If you do have to uh, move on, uh, don't worry. Everything's being recorded and will be shared with all attendees, registrants uh, following the event. So we've had a few questions come in, again, about... Um, this piezoelectric method, uh, and then pairing measurements with, with patch clamp or action potential. So, uh, specifically, someone has written, I would like to know about the piezoelectric method. Is it possible to patch clamp the cell at the same time? So, I can chime in a little bit there because I've, I've, I've done these experiments. Um, and, yes, the bottom line is, yes, it is possible. Um, you can... Particularly what we've done is we use sort of a, a half cell stretch configuration where you attach your force transducer about uh, halfway to three quarters down the length of a cell on the longitudinal axis. The piezo will be attached to the far end. You then drive your stretches from that far end, but patch on the free end that's behind the force transducer side. So this free end of the cell is not as exposed as much to the length changes um, that are going to occur because it has that fixed force transducer between it and the length controller. And this minimizes the disruption of your patch that can break your seal and disrupt electrophysiology experiments. So this is, it's certainly tricky to do. It's a lot of hardware all in the same bath at the same time. Um, but, but the experiments can certainly be done and would be really the most precise demonstrations of sort of mechanoregulation of electrophysiology um, that's been done to date. Excellent. It, it, um, anything to add, Michael or Joe, on uh, that method? Or it sounds like Ben's answer was very complete, but just give you the opportunity to chime in. Uh, 
Back, back in Oxford, uh, similar experiments were done. It was considered hard, so he didn't do it when he didn't have to, but it could be done. Um, and mostly by staying on, f finding a part of the cell that, uh, that didn't move much. Uh, that kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? Okay. Very good. Um, okay, so a couple other questions. Oh yeah, we had we had one come in earlier, and again, it's um, it's it's um, in lines with also uh, looking at fluorescence measurements. So uh, one of our uh, audience members wanted to know: Is there a trick to avoid the reduction of the contraction efficiency after incubation of fewer two on cardiomyocytes? I'll go ahead and, yeah. and answer that. So that's always uh, an issue whenever you're using VR2. The high affinity for calcium and the slow off rate can affect the measurements regardless of whether you're attaching them or not. Um, so the onus is always on the experimenter to to introduce the, the least amount of furor that they can in order to, to do the measurements properly um, and while still maintaining a good signal to noise ratio uh, for, for the fluorescent signal. Michael, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I have used uh, Fura a fair bit for these experiments, and you do have to be careful, especially if you have cells that are slightly calcium overloaded on diastole. Especially in diastole, Fura does have an effect. After you add Fura, it's actually easier to stretch your cells because it, it soaks up some of the calcium and reduce, you, reduce, re, you reduce the activation level of the cell. So my guess is that it would also affect contractile speed. Uh, so it's something to be aware of uh, and be consistent in what you do. So even if there is somewhat of a bias, it should be the same bias in every experiment. Get a good objective, minimize the loading and... Uh, so it's all, it's, it, at the end of the day, not necessarily any tricks, but it's all about consistency and uh, reproducible methods and tight controls. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and, and and to a large extent, it's uh, you, you know you need to get good signal to noise, but you don't need to get a, a, a massive signal with your in order to make reasonable analysis of it. So the you know, the important thing is not that you get the best possible magnitude of response. Yeah, the best case scenario is to get the most physiologic response. So you know it, load load as little as possible in order to do that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Perfect. Um, okay, I think we've got time for maybe one, two more questions. Uh, we've had a few um, questions come in from audience about just specific types of cells that could be uh, studied. Um, anything that we can, you can share with the audience regarding atrial myocytes and then also, um, let me just look for the other one here. Uh, Lost it. Yeah, so let's stick with atrial myocytes for now. Um, you know, can 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 this be used uh, in that type of sample? And then smooth muscle cells, I believe, uh, was the other uh, question. I can chime in on, on both of those um, from past experience. So some of my colleagues in the letter lab have um, utilized this technique and, and done actually quite a bit of work on atrial cells. Uh, Mara Greiser specifically has had good success using this technique on atrial myocytes, isolated, I believe, from both rabbit and mouse. Um, and as far as smooth muscle cells, did some of these experiments myself as well, and I know some others too who have done this on uh, smooth muscle cells. Depending on the diameter of the cell, um, we've used smaller glass micro rods or larger diameter rods at times to optimize, um, but that can depend on, especially with smooth muscle cells where there's such a diversity in morphology um, on the cell type that you're, that you're using. But uh, again, bottom line is that certainly this, these experiments have been done on both atrial and smooth muscle cells. Excellent. Perfect. Um, all right, guys. Well, you know what? Actually, at that point, at this point, I'm going to say that uh, we'll officially close down the Q&A. Um, and uh, again, all of this information, everything that has been shared from the audience is being collected. It will be put into a Q&A report uh, answered by our, our presenters and staff at Ion Optics. And um, the recording of this session and the slide deck will be sent to all those that registered as well. So at this point, uh, let me officially uh, thank uh, Dr. Ben Prosser and uh, Dr. Michael Helms. Uh, wonderful content presentation day, so thank you, gentlemen. And also thanks to Joe Seguer for joining us in the Q&A. And, um, uh, and obviously thank you to those in the audience for being a part of our session today. So following this event, when you close out, you'll be welcome to, uh, to uh, provide additional feedback on how uh, we can improve your experience with these events and answer questions. So please complete the survey.
Uh, it'll just take a few minutes. And uh, stay tuned for more events coming soon from Inside Scientific. We'd love to have you all back again in the near future. So thanks, guys, and um, we'll sign off now. Thanks Thank so you, Eddie. Fabulous. Okay, have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye for now.